Okay, let me uh, welcome to the show uh, Dr. Michael Goumet. Uh, let's just bring Michael in. Michael, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show. It's a pleasure, Pat, and nice to meet you, Jerry. Oh, good evening. Same to you. There is a story that's out today that I suspect on any other day would probably be leading all the news bulletins around the country. But because of today's news around... Um, Mr. Luxon's cabinet being in disarray. It feels like this story has taken a little bit of a back seat today. I get the sense, because I see some more articles going up at five o'clock this evening about it, that maybe tomorrow this will start to be a little more looked into by the media. Long story short, uh, you were the receiver of a leak that revealed millions of dollars of cuts at Te Fata Ora. Now, we're being told as the public that there are cuts and you know money saving things going on through all the government departments but this seems different to what's going on can we just maybe take a step back can i throw you the ball and can you tell us about the documents you received and why they're so important for the public to know about yeah certainly pat and uh, for those of you that are watching uh these documents were dropped in our private letterbox on saturday much to my surprise and uh, i was very interested to open them up and see what I had before me. And uh, it was very apparent very quickly that this was significant and needed to go beyond me, obviously. And I suspect the person who dropped them off, or persons, as it may be, and if that person or person is watching, thank you very much for doing that. If that person or persons hadn't done that, I doubt very much that we would know that the proposal is that PricewaterhouseCoopers has been charged with finding the sum of 13.3 million in savings between now, mid-April, and the end of June at Canterbury Waitaha, the former CDHB. Now, that's a fairly significant sum of money, and I thought to myself, how on earth could you possibly find savings to that extent in such a short period of time? So that was the first thing. The second thing was the fact that PwC had been engaged in this project in the first place. Now, we know that the big accounting firms in the past have done huge exercises like this, and we also know that they've been done at huge cost to the taxpayer. Mm. So consequently, I've put an OIA into the Ministry of Health, uh, and Health New Zealand rather, asking a series of questions. And one of those, is this distributed nationwide, which I now know uh, this afternoon I've learned that it has been. And secondly, how much are PwC paying or being paid for this exercise? Thirdly, who's paying PwC? Is it going to be the individual entities, the 20 mm. or so that were the former DHBs, now inside Health New Zealand, are they going to be levied with a massive accounting bill to PwC or is Health New Zealand in fact picking up the tab or is the government going to fund it? We need to know who is paying for this. But again, my background's in accountancy as well. And you've got to ask yourself, why do they need to engage an accountancy firm like this to find cuts inside an organisation that probably has just as qualified senior financial accountants and management accounts in the organisation in the first place. So why on earth isn't it actually their job to be finding those savings instead of paying more money out of the taxpayer purse to fund it? So that was really what I was concerned about. And as I say, if this person hadn't dropped these documents in, we'd be none the wiser tonight what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, I was inspired by a story on the radio last night by a chap called Graham, uh, who was saying that he'd been into Christchurch Hospital recently uh, for bowel cancer surgery. And he was all gowned up and prepped up, ready to go, when he got told to his horror uh, that um, they weren't going to perform the surgery that day and he should go home and they'll be in touch. Now, if you've got that kind of behaviour going on inside one of our you know, prominent hospitals, and on the other hand, they're being told you've got to cut 13.3 million, no wonder Graham was told to go home. Something is going on here that we need to dig deeper. Now, Canterbury Waitaha came out with what I would consider to be weasel words uh, for an excuse as to why his surgery didn't go ahead. And I can't recall the exact wording, but to me, they just sounded like a bunch of weasel words that uh, why on earth couldn't this guy have got his surgery? But as I say, if that's going on and we've been told we're going to cut 13.3 million out of your budget in two or less than three months, there is something seriously wrong. But worse than that, this is nationwide. It's not just here in Canterbury. It's right across the country. So right. how much exactly uh, Health New Zealand trying to save, quote, save, across the 20 former DHBs in this exercise? 
So surely we've got to be asking the questions and surely we need answers. Yeah, uh, in the uh, newsroom article, it says this, because one of the questions, of course, we think of is, you know, the back office and the front line, the back office, front line, back office, front line, mm. which we've been told mm. about for 18 months now. Uh, while thousands of public sector jobs are being cut as part of government savings drive, Health Minister Dr Shane Reti says Te Whatu Ora isn't subject to that directive. So this is the other thing. Dr Shane Reti is telling us, telling the country, that there's not going to be any staffing cuts at all. So if there's not going to be staffing cuts, where the hell are they finding $13.3 million from to save when we already know that the you know the public health system seems well you know some parts of the world it's not doing too bad but it is actually underfunded already so what mm. are they going to do to save these 13.3 million dollars in two and a half months if if they're not going to just get rid of a bunch of staff that's the question now one of the projects i've been working on for some time now is going back and looking at uh, the crown health enterprise accounts for canterbury from 1993 right through to 2000 and then the DHB, CDHB from 2000 to 2022. And so I've compiled a pretty massive spreadsheet. I was originally asked by some senior clinicians, could I please explain why DHBs were running financial deficits? And, I, and they said, look, could you write a paper for about, say, five, five and a half thousand words? My research to date is up to 80,000 words <laughs> and still going, partly because I couldn't get the full set of 2022 accounts out of the DHBs until this year. Uh, it took a lot of letters and emails rather to the minister to say, where are these accounts? I finally have them. And secondly, Health New Zealand's own accounts, which were due 30th of June, 2023, they were not released till the 5th of uh, December last year. So I now have those figures and we, we find yet more problems. The 2023 accounts for H Health New Zealand have no comparative figures. So in other words, they haven't consolidated the former 20 DHBs for 2022 as you would normally do, pardon me, in an accounting exercise, and you put those comparative figures alongside your actuals for this financial year. So we actually have no idea how well Health New Zealand has done relative to the 20 DHBs in the previous financial year. But what we can say is two things. One, Health New Zealand ran a deficit last year, 2023, of over 1 billion, that's B for billion dollars, and the indications are that Health New Zealand is set to run yet another massive deficit this financial year, 30th of June 2024. But of course, we won't have those numbers, probably, I would say, until December this year. So, you know, in spite of Dr. Reddy saying, oh, we're going to make savings and all the rest of it, we are basically doing the same thing we've done since 1993. We are progressively running deficits right across our public health system. Why? Because it is fundamentally underfunded. And we yeah. have a continuation of that. And now they're trying to save 13.3 million. Now, let me tell you another story. In 2020, I underwent major prostate cancer surgery. Uh, that all went very well. I was thankful for that. So I was recuperating at home and the press ran an article about how the CDHB was going to save money. Someone had the bright idea that we're going to stop giving patients non-skid socks. So they're the socks with a little rubber feet on so that yeah. when you walk on a wet floor, you don't fall over. Okay. But we're going to save $40,000 a year if we don't give patients non-skid socks. I wrote a letter and said, I've just recovered from surgery. If I'd got out of bed without my non-skid socks on to go to the bathroom, chances are I would have slipped over on the wet floor, fractured my hip, finished up back in hospital, at what extra cost to the DHB over and above the 40000 to save the sock money? Not, so not, to me, this... not to mention your health and what happens when sometimes people go into hospital and then don't come out again. Who knows? Oh, well, I didn't want to say that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's right. Yeah. But that's the reality. So that's the kind of thinking that's been going on, which is absolute nonsense. And then we saw articles in the press during the year about children being denied grommet surgery uh, for various reasons. So I wrote another letter. You know, we can't even look after our children who desperately, one mother got told she had to wait six months for her child to get grommets. And her argument was, well, my child can't go to school, can't learn, can't socialise because this child needs grommets. And mm. yet we can't afford it. And now we're going to slash 13.3 million from where? Yeah. From where? That's the quick, and, and also, of course, the irony that they're uh, using PwC, uh, who are consultants, whilst they've spent the past 18 months criticising Labor for using all their consultants. Chewy, what do you want, sir? Jump in, sir. 
I, I, I think the thing that really sticks in my craw, and I'm sure this is going to be reflected in other DHPs that have been asked to pull out of their assholes a similar amount of money, um, but the thing that immediately jumped to mind here is, oh, cool, the, the national big government is screwing over Canterbury again. Like, they screwed them in mm, the aftermath mm. of the Christchurch earthquake. Yep. Uh, they criminally underfunded the DHB at that point where people were dealing with severe mental health issues and stuff like mm. that in the fallout to mm. that earthquake. Mm. Um, their hospital needs work. They're constantly understaffed. And mm. guess what, guys? Here it comes again. Mm -hmm. I'm, Absolutely. I'm so, so glad that someone has linked this and, and got this out because his government of transparency wouldn't have told us about it. <laughs> no, like, that's, that's, that's who, the who thing. Who hasn't <laughs> found $12 million, $13 million down the back of the couch in the ER? Yeah. In two like, months. It, in two it, months. It's absolutely laughable that these yeah. people think that there's just that much money sloshing around. And mm. Who's gone to a hospital and gone, man? everybody's getting seen to really really quickly and there's loads of mm. staff and it's uh, the mm. building's in fantastic condition it's mm. it's it's just diabolical mm. although chewy staring what... down the barrel of a junior junior doctor's yeah, strike well, now yeah yeah, yeah. i was I, and... were you suggesting were you suggesting though chewy when you said they're going to pull out their asshole that maybe they'll find the savings within the prostate cancer you know research area is that is that where they're going to find it <laughs> Is that what you meant? I'm just trying to get clarity. Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, specifically that that department and area okay, of research. Proctology, um, we're, I mean, proctology, we're coming for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm going to be talking about the, the the Southern DHB here with my own experience last year of having um, some kidney issues. And I, I ended up going private because I had um, insurance through my work, but I started through the public process. Mm. And my experience was not good. And it's, it was very, very clear to me what was causing it to be not good. And that is because people in the Dunedin Hospital are absolutely under the gun. Like, mm. it, it didn't feel like there was enough staff to make sure that people would keep track of. There certainly wasn't enough staff to get um, operations done and that sort of thing. I got bounced from clinic to clinic and um, they were actually contacting me about not turning up to clinics about three months after I said I'd gone private. Mm -hmm. um, and it just it just shows to me that that's the reflection of, of the department that is under pressure. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about people, you know, oh, it's not going to affect the front line. It's the, it's the back office people that are making sure that they know where the patients are at. Mm -hmm. Whether they're still enrolled, whether they still need to go to the clinic. Like I was, I was furious when someone rang me up and said, "Oh, you're supposed to be at clinic," and I'm like, "No, no, I wasn't. I was never supposed to be at clinic." And now, like, I felt mm. like I've wasted someone's time, someone's mm. opportunity. You know, there's a cost to, to that mismanagement. Mm. Earlier this year, I got a letter advising me that I had an appointment for a bone density scan, which is a usual follow-up with prostate issues over hormone therapy and so on. So I duly trotted off to have my bone density scan. And I said to the radiologist, I'm a bit surprised that I got this letter because I wasn't expecting it. Um, so how come you wrote to me and said I needed to come in for a scan? Oh, no, she said, we're just catching up from the backlog from last year. You were due for this in October. <laughs> so, you know, there you go. That's how far behind they were and catching up with people like me needing bone density scans. At least I got it. That was good. But yeah. coming back to Graham, Graham's story, at least he was back on the air again, and he said that um, the DHB, Canterbury Waitaha, are going to put him into the public system. Now, that's good for Graham. But here's the point. The cost of putting into the public, the private system, like St George's Hospital, is going to be X number of times greater than it would have cost for him to have had the surgery in yep. Christchurch Hospital if he'd had it when he should have had it. So this is what happens. We have this rolling effect where we can't do it here, so we'll put you into the private system. Trouble is the private system charges you at market rates and you'll be paying a jolly sight more. Well, Canterbury will be paying a jolly sight more mm. uh, for the surgery. So again, this is where the money's going. We can't do and it in Christchurch, but we'll pay to go here. So there we go. So maybe what they need to do is 13.3 million. Maybe they need to stop sending people to St. George's Hospital for surgery and just mm -hmm. let them take their risk, take the chances. 
the um, the thing that seems fairly obvious, if we believe that they're not going to lose staff, it's fine, I'm happy to take that because that's what they've said, that means they are needing to do the same work as they're doing right now, or as this government has been talking about how the last government went backwards, they'll want them to do more and get more quote-unquote outcomes on less money for what they're doing mm. right now. We've already mm. seen articles coming out saying like things like overtime, extra shifts, agency nurses are all mm. gone. And so mm. to, to your point, Michael, therefore, if some if, if there's two or three or four nurses sick, they don't have agency nurses to come in and replace them. That means that that mm. ward is slower that day. That means chewy, mm. you're, you're, you might get bounced around. And mm. and it just seems so cynical. And I'm, I'm about to do it. I can't do two things at once. I'm a male. Um, I want to know what 13 and a half million out of $3 billion is as a percentage, because tax, mm. you know, like uh, landlords can get $3 billion back, but we've got mm. to find 13 and a half million dollars out of the system whilst mm. getting better results and not firing staff. It's just like, I feel like if this was in a, like a, a, in the old term, a form three accounting class, mm. the 13 year olds would be going, this doesn't work. But it mm. seems to be working at the moment, Michael. Mm. Mm. Well, no, you're right. It doesn't work. And some of the other things in the uh, documents that were released to me as well, uh, there's an intention there to review the um, prosthetic services uh, activities. So as I said on the radio this afternoon, uh, is this the case then that, um, all right, Pat, look, you'd like to have a nice new titanium leg, but because we've got a cost-cutting exercise going on, we can't afford to give you a nice new titanium leg. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to carve your leg out a nice pine. How'd you like that instead? That yeah. way you'll save money. So is this, I mean, who is the person that said we've got to review the prosthetic services? I mean, these are highly specialized, you know, unique people. I've met them in my past working life. I've worked with them around the Pacific. These mm. are specialized people. And yet they're saying we need to review what you're doing with your resources. This is mm. just sheer stupidity. I get the feeling that there are bean counters there who have never been outside their office and don't actually understand the reality of the world in which people actually have to live and in this case work because they're coming up with these crazy ideas. It's like the sock idea. And now we're going to do the same thing with prosthetics. So you've got to ask yourself, what really is, who's the thinking behind all of this? And where on earth is that going to find 13.3 million and pay PwC a nice big fat fee for doing it? and the junior doctors get a pay rise and keep the nurses happy and all those things as well. I want to ask yeah. you one more question. And when I read this paragraph out of the story, it made me think of that old adage, you know, when people say practice makes perfect. And mm. I always say to people, it's not true because like I used to play golf quite a lot. And if through my <laughs> practice, I kept slicing the ball, then mm. what I was practicing is the wrong thing. That yeah. saying should be perfect practice makes perfect because mm. you can practice the wrong thing, the wrong skill, mm and get good mm. at doing the wrong skill. You've said in this article, it's, you've quoted to be saying, um, they talk about efficiencies, but they don't talk about being effective. There's mm. a huge mm. difference between the two. You can be bloody efficient, but you're <laughs> doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Can you just speak to that? Yeah, well, absolutely. And that's exactly what it means. And I know that from my past experience and numerous careers over many years, I've been involved in the nonprofit sector for over 35 years. And uh, I've done postgraduate study of various kinds, and I do an awful lot of reading. If you can see the rest of my library, you'll find there's all <laughs> sorts of all sorts of books there, from World War II uh, right through to you know, management and so on and so forth. And you learn these things by experience. That yes, it's very all very well to be efficient at what you're doing, but if you're not being effective and achieving things, um, then you're wasting your time. And this is what this document talks about: effic efficiency but nothing about being effective in what you're doing. So mm -hmm. there's an issue. Yeah. And the doctors here, the, the people who wrote this document, uh, is point out something as well. And it's along the lines that, you know, for every dollar we invest in public health, there's a 3 to $5 return. These guys clearly hadn't read a book. I've got it right here. It's called Why Austerity Kills. I don't know if you can see it on my telly. Yep, uh, there the you go, economic. The, the Body Economic by Stuckler and um, Bazu. And I was browsing through it again this afternoon, ready for tonight. Uh, and they talk in here about how public investment boosts the economy by more than $3 for every dollar spent. Uh, and so on and so it goes. Um, yeah, so at the end of the day, I don't think 
these people in Price Waterhouse have ever read anything like that and understand that instead of looking for cost savings, we should be looking how effective is our investment and is it generating a greater return for every dollar we're spending? No, no. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to find savings. And that way, we'll become very efficient, but we won't be at all effective in what we're doing. And mm. therefore, we won't have the outcomes that we expect. And people will continue to suffer. And we'll have the constant problem of EDs being overflowed in the weekends because people can't afford to go to their GP. They'll go instead to the ED departments. And the problem just perpetuates itself. But we're going to slash 13.3 million in two months from your budget in Canterbury. It just does not add up like a fourth, third form class question was as well. It doesn't stack up. Yeah. Joe, you got anything else? I've got one more question, but you jump in now. Yeah, I, I tell you what this wrecks to me of is is what has been done to the NHS in the UK. Um, ever, absolutely savage services in the quest for saving mm. and just running that down to the point where it's just plump for private investment um mm. private hospitals and that sort of thing again to to take up the slack because they've ruined that system um and effectively being subsidized by the government as well we see this in so many sectors over here and that was under a labor government mm. you know um, landlords basically charging rents that are too high for people to afford so the government has to subsidize those rents um, it, it's this whole thing of just absolutely running something down, turning it around and going, see, the private sector is much better at this. So mm. we're just going to bow out of providing the service. Mm. Mm. Um, do you, do you, would you agree with that? Do you think that that's maybe what's, what's going on? Oh, I think so. Um, I talked about in the letters of the press, which I don't think they published, um, I talked about the production line health system that's been created here, where you're getting fed in and getting fed out. Again, I had that experience doing the prostate cancer journey, and it really was a production line. There's a whole lot of us that lined up to do the, the old P test with the um, P flow meter and that kind of thing. Um, did that one, then got on to meet the clinician to do the biopsy, and I said to him, look, uh, I'd like a conversation, please, before we proceed. And he said, no, no, I'm here to do a biopsy. I said, no, no, I want a conversation. So we agreed not to proceed. I wrote a letter of complaint and said, as a patient, I have a right to know what's been done to my body. Got sure. a nice letter of apology, got back into the system and away you went again. But it was very much, very clearly a production line process. And you didn't dare interrupt it because, you know, it upset the flow, literally. <laughs> so, yes, <laughs> that goes on. But the other thing here in this document from Health New Zealand, they talk about continuous performance improvement and financial sustainability and they've set up a steering group and they've got leadership teams and they're going to have three hour workshops and so once again we've got a system where there's going to be lots of meetings lots of um, processes lots of workshops to talk about things who's doing anything and are they involving the clinicians who actually know what needs to be done i meet regularly with a retired professor from otago and we talk about this thing on a regular basis but you see, these chaps actually know what needs to be done. But who's listening to them? Mm. If the Price Waterhouse went to these chaps and uh, and the woman as well, of course, and said, we'd like your advice about how we could become more effective and efficient in what we're doing, they would probably have the answers. But because they don't go and ask those questions, they're the accountants, they know best. Sorry, no, you don't. You need to talk to the people who know. If they did that, I'm sure we'd probably see a huge change around, but we don't see that process, and I don't think that's going to happen here either. Um, Michael, if people want to know uh, more about the book you were just mentioning, and I think it's very appropriate that you did some research before coming on our show, because we ask the hard questions here, and you've got to be on your <laughs> best game. Uh, the Body Economic Why Austerity Kills. It's uh, I've just actually purchased it as you're talking on uh, Audible, so I listen to it. Um, one other thing I want to ask you, um, it seems that these sorts of conversations have happened before. These sorts of conversations, there's a part of the article and talks about 2020 when there was an executive exodus 
Uh, people in 2020 were saying that what was being done then in the cuts led to increased costs, fewer patients getting treatment, longer stays for patients and lower quality of care. The same approach was, was taken decades ago. That didn't work then, he said. It's disturbing the leaked documents that makes no reference to quality of patient care, as you're saying, and outcomes. And that the situ situation today is reminding some people of things we've seen before. So this seems like it's the kind of thing that's come up on some level in some way before. And for whatever reason, they're trying to repeat it right now and get a different outcome, perhaps? Oh, look, you're absolutely right, Pat. And again, this professor I meet with, he tells me of their experiences meeting previous Ministers of Health and wanting to talk about improving systems and processes and getting the runaround. Now, again, to what you're saying there, I've got another little book here, uh, which I'll hold up for the camera, if you can take a <laughs> screenshot of that. This is called The Health of the People by David Skegg. Uh, and it talks about the public health issues in the 1990s and the issues that David talks about in here are the same things we're talking about today. And this was published in 1990. Yep. Nothing yeah. has changed. People want to know. So about it. There it is right there. See if you can find it. David Skeg. Yeah, the health of people, David Skeg. It's a, it's yep. can, might be a bit hard to find. But again, if you read that, you think, well, we've gone back to the 1990s. Nothing's moved on. It's really tragic to see that. I mean, I think mean, what's what's same about the 1990s and today? I mean, like, like, is it something to do with the color of the people sitting on the ninth floor? You know, that blue tinge to them, something that's what maybe there's a connective there. Hey, it's been fantastic talking to you, Michael. Really appreciate you giving us some time. The chat's been going off as well. People, people haven't heard this story yet. So it feels like this, I think some okay. of our people that this is the first place they're hearing it from. And as I said, right. I think this will, um, this will grow over the next coming days because it's, it's really serious. I mean, the idea that they're going to try and save thirteen and a half million dollars from one what used to be DHB, you know, in two months without firing people—that's terrifying. You know, what? How many procedures are going to be put off? How many surgeries are going to get delayed? How many are, are going to get cancelled because they're not bringing in agency nurses when there's a particular line of COVID going through the nurses there? Like, it just—it's—it's it's kind of quite terrifying. So, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I guess we look forward to you receiving more leaks. And we hope Pat, we get can to speak I, can to you I just, again super soon. Yep, go. Can I just make two quick comments before we go? Sure. Two Please things. Dr. Phil Bagshaw set up our first charity hospital. Why have we got a charity hospital in Canterbury? Because the public system can't provide. Now we have one on Southland. I believe there's one in Auckland and others. So that's what's happening. That's another story. Uh, the other thing is there's another book here that readers should get their hands on. It's a Penguin publication called The Spirit Level. Why equality is better for everyone. Talks about the same kinds of things. There you go. See if you can get a shot of that. Read that as well. And my colleagues um, that I meet with regularly, they actually bought this book and sent it to members of parliament and said, you need to read this to understand what you're doing wrong. But guess what? Nothing's changed. So we've got to keep working on change. Yeah. And it's got to be effective change. Thank you very much for having me, Pat and Chewy. Appreciate the chance no to have a chat. Uh, it's been great. It's been very informative. And uh, thank you for giving up some of your time this evening. And uh, I'm glad you had a nice meal out this evening as well. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Pat. Kia ora again, Fano. The clip you've just watched is brought to you today by our patrons. If you want to be a part of what we do, if you want to get behind what we're doing, if you're enjoying our content and wanting to share our content, then maybe you would consider being a patron to Big Hairy News. Head to www.patreon.com forward slash Big Hairy News to sign up to one of our levels and be a patron. At this point, we are only a listener and viewer supported show. It all comes down to you guys. If you feel like jumping on board to help, then head to patreon.com forward slash big hairy news. Hooroo.